Paranormal Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network. Whatever or whoever it is that haunts that house, the manifestations are the most powerful and evil in their experience. They all mention nameless horrors. This is Malcolm Robinson and you're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, the UK's biggest paranormal network. And this is Paranormal Dimensions with David Young. Going to be definitely interesting, something you don't want to miss. Hello and welcome to another Paranormal Dimensions. I hope everyone's trying to stay safe and uh, keeping your sanity out there in these troubled times. Thank you for that intro, Malcolm. Now, today's guest is Mr. Simon Entwistle. He has his own show on this network, and um, he's going to be telling us a few ghost stories, and uh, I'm sure we'll find out a little bit more about Simon. So, here we go. Let's meet Simon. Hello, Simon. Welcome to the show. My pleasure, David. Always great to talk to you. It's fantastic to have you back. You were on the June, um, it was on the June, the, uh, I don't know what date was, it was in June of 2019, you were on before. That was show number 18, believe it or not. This, this is actually show number 84. So Come I'm on. actually amazed we've got, I've got this far. <laughs> You've done very well, David. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I, I never would have foreseen it to come this far, but, uh, and your show's still doing well. It's very popular still, isn't it? Uh, yes, we, we just kept going, David, that's for sure. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I've, I've heard quite a few of them, and they're, they're, they're brilliant. But, uh, and I'm sure they do well around the world. I know they get a good listenership anyway. That's great. Anyway, so how's business been for you with all this COVID lockdowns and God knows what else has been going on? Uh, David, um, it's been devastating, actually. Um, yeah. I run my own tourism business. Um, they consist of coach tours, ghost walks, visits to halls, etc. And because of the social distancing, mm. I've lost all the coach tours. Um, I um, was a regular at three gorgeous halls in the north of England. Um, they've all had to be cancelled. Um, so I've had a lot of time on my hands, really, mm. uh, mainly at, just at home. But um, it was fine for the first three months, but after a while it does get very, very boring. Yeah, I know. Well, I, I, I think one of them was the Salmsbury Hall, is it? Which I, well, one, one that I actually know well. It's a very, very beautiful building, Salmsbury mm. Hall, Stanley Hall, Gawthorpe Hall, and Brusham Hall. I've been a regular there for quite a long time now, and uh, they've had to close because of these terrible restrictions, I'm afraid. Yeah, well, have they actually closed right up? Um, well, they, they are doing lunches, and the shop is open, but they're not doing any guided tours because of this social distancing. And, of course, the halls are... Some of the rooms are quite tight, really, so getting yeah. 40 people in there uh, under these COVID rules just wouldn't happen, David, really. I oh, know. It must be. So, well, they really must be uh, suffering financially terribly, these places, mustn't they? Plus, it's all the smaller people that get laid off as well, isn't it? And, you know, well, when, I say, when I say smaller people, it doesn't demean their importance. But, it, unfortunately, there is a hierarchy that... And, unfortunately, the the, 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 the sort of the cheaper the lab, cheaper labour people do get laid off, don't they? You know, yes, so. they're, they're the people suffer first, David. But um, what I can't really understand is that, apparently, in Sweden, there's no lockdown whatsoever. I and, know. Uh, I know. It, uh, and they, they seem to have a much lower death rate than the United Kingdom. Yeah, well, I don't really want to get into this death rate thing. I, I don't know if you know about my beliefs in all this. Um, <laughs> but it's kind of a different life to what I've got on this radio show. Okay, uh, I, yeah. I actually don't believe a lot of what we're told. I mean, the basis of my 
thing is I don't believe a lot of we're, what we're being told anyway. The the, the readings are, are all wrong. They're, they're, um, they actually admitted that they've got a lot of the, the uh, readings, uh, the, you know, like the COVID readings, um, doubled up and everything. I, mean, I don't want to go too too much detail right, about it, right. but um, and I will just say also that, to my knowledge, they still haven't isolated COVID-19 from any other coronavirus. This is why they talk about coronavirus rather than COVID-19. And if anyone out there can send me a link that tells me exactly how they've, they've divided COVID-19 from any other co- coronavirus, please send it to me. Because as far as I know, there's nothing out there. Even the government's been asked that question and nothing's come back. Right, right, right. So, anyway, but we, I think, leave it there, unless you want to say something okay. else about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be going on all about COVID, and I think we get enough of it on the television and radio as it is. <laughs> but, um, anyway, I, mean, I obviously you've not been able to do your tours, but um, obviously you're still doing your um, radio show with your ghost stories, and would you, have you got some good ghost stories to, to relate to our people out there? I certainly well, they have. They wouldn't have heard of my show anyway, might, yeah. <laughs> I certainly have, Dave, and uh, what I love about ghost stories is they get people's attention. Yeah. Um, I do visit schools and, um, in some cases, primary schools, actually, and uh, um, I was very surprised when I was first asked because, um, you know, um, I said to the teachers, well, do kids really want to hear about blood, gore, and horror? Mm. And she said, oh, yes, the more the yeah, merrier. Right. Yeah, we all, we all do back then. <laughs> it's, it's really great to have a captive audience with children, really. And um, one story which um, always gets the attention, um, we mentioned Psalmsbury Hall before, Dave. Yeah. Uh, there's a huge connection with the famous Pendle Witch Trials of, of 1612, a huge connection um, with a group of ladies known as the Psalmsbury Hall Witches. And they were all all arrested at exactly the same time as the Pendle Witches, and they were sent to the city of Lancaster uh, to be put on trial at the same time. But they were kept in a totally different cell to the Elizabeth Southern, to Anne Whittle, to Anne Redfern, to Catherine Hewitt, Alice Gray, Elizabeth Device, James Device, Jeanette Device, and Alice Nutter, John and Jane Bullcock. They were the Pendle witches, and they were all found guilty of witchcraft on the 20th of August 1612. In the next cell were the Salisbury Hall witches, and they consisted of Jane Southworth and Jean and Ellen Brearley. Jean and Ellen were both um, twin sisters, and they were very, very good friends of Jane Southworth. Now, you imagine Salisbury Hall, beautiful, beautiful building. Mm. Um, Jane's father was Sir Richard Southworth, an exceptionally wealthy man, and you can imagine the horror when he heard banging on the door of the main hall, he opened the door, and there was the king's commissioner from Lancaster City Castle. In the name of the king, we arrest you, Jane Southworth, Eugene and Ellen Braley, under the Witchcraft Act. The three of them were absolutely horrified. They were chained, placed in a cart, and transported from Sarsby Hall over what we call the beautiful Trough of Boland, this rather gorgeous road that led into the city of Lancaster. There they were thrown into the cell next door to the Pendle Witches. They never saw them. They may have heard muffled shouts and screams from the thick castle walls, but on the 20th of August, 1612, Jane Southworth heard this huge roar and she climbed on the shoulders of her two best friends, the Braley sisters, looked out her cell window, and there, to her horror, she saw the Pendle witches standing on trestles with ropes around their necks in the courtyard beneath her. And then, to her horror, she saw the trestles being kicked out from underneath each and each individual one of them. These people did not hang. They strangled to death. It was a slow, slow strangulation. Um, Jane witnessed the whole of this terrible execution and then she heard the sounds of footsteps that got louder and louder and louder a key was placed in her cell door the cell door opened and there was Mr Thomas Cavall the head jailer of Lancaster City Castle right you three we just dealt with that lot it's your turn next follow me you can imagine the horror the paranoia the fear that must have haunted Jane, because she just witnessed the execution, and they made their way up the twisting staircase and into the, exactly the same, the same corpse that had just dispatched the Pendle witches. They stood in front of Sir James Oltham, Sir Edmund Bromley, Thomas Potts, Roger Noel, William Holden, and John Bannister. The prosecution. 
There was no defence council because no one dared take on the King of England. It was going to be very, very one-sided. Now, as was the case with the Pendle witches and the Sandry Hall witches, they had child witnesses. And it was believed at that period of time that children could not be manipulated. In the case of the Sandry Hall witches, they brought in a little girl of six years old. She was called Gracie Sowerbuts. Gracie was the head gardener's daughter of Sandry Hall. Just six years of age, she was brought into the courts and Roger Noel, the local magistrate, picked her up and put her on top of a desk so the jury could see her. The two circuit judges, James Oldham and Edmund Brummer, then shouted, Right, young lady, read out your testimony against these three witches. I will, sir. I was walking along the banks of the River Ribble, sir. I saw James Southworth and the two Braley sisters swimming in the river, sir. It was a very, very hot summer's day. I then saw these unusual dogs. I've never seen the breed before, sir. Unusual dogs with cloven hooves, very large heads like bears, long backs. They jumped into the river, sir. They then materialised into human beings, slightly dark-skinned human beings. They picked up all three women. They danced in a circle. They paired off for a meal. I then watched from a distance, sir, as fraternisation was taking place with these, these demonic spectres. On the second day, Ellen Braley came to see me. She changed from a woman into a dog, sir, and she tried to suffocate me under a blanket of straw, but I escaped. On the third day, the three of them came to see me again, sir, Jane Southworth and the two Braley sisters. They said, Gracie, would you like to have a bit of fun today? I said, what do you mean by fun? Well, at Sarnsby Hall, a little boy has just been born called Thomas Walshman. He's been born to one of the footmen. We would like to drink his blood. No, 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 said young Gracie. But he hasn't been christened, said James Southworth. No, no, I don't want to get involved in that. James Oldham, one of the head judges at Lancaster City Castle, brought the gavel up and was about to sentence them to death when his companion, Sir Edmund Bromley, said, No, 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 let her finish her testimony. Continue, young lady. Sir, in the dead of night, they made their way to Sarnsby Hall, and they walked up to the long gallery where the little Welshman boy was sleeping. They took him from his cradle. Over four nights they repeated this process by pricking his stomach and drinking his blood. He then died, sir, of blood loss, and was buried at Sarnsby Church, sir. In the dead of night, the three of them came back, sir, they dug up the coffin, they took the baby from the coffin, they boiled the baby's flesh, they consumed the flesh and kept some body ointments that would enable them to change shape. James Olfen then picked the gavel. Right! We find the three of you guilty of witchcraft! You will die like the rest of them! Before the gavel came down, James Southworth pulled off what I can only describe as a short miracle. Sir! Sir, I beg of you to cross-examine this young girl, sir. She has been manipulated by a Catholic priest hiding at Sarsby Hall called Thomason, sir. Just that one word, Catholicism, made the judges sit back. Uh, you're an Anglican, you say? Yes, sir. I married her to the south of the family, sir. You've never liked me because of my Anglican views, sir. This young girl's been manipulated by a Catholic priest hiding at Sarsby Hall, sir. Please cross-examine her. They took Gracie next door. You can imagine Jane and the two Braley sisters must have felt real intense frustration and fear and worry. Were they going to hang? Or were they going to be set free? After what seemed an eternity, the judges came back into the court with young Gracie Sowerbuts. Let's restate the, the, the grouping, please. Everyone took their seats, and Jane and the two Braley sisters waited. In the light of new evidence, we find you, Jane South of Eugene and Ellen Braley, innocent of the crimes against you. You are free to go. The three of them hugged each other. They jumped for joy. As they left Lancaster City Castle, Jane turned and she saw the pillory, the scaffold. She saw the pendant just still hanging and blowing in the wind. At the end of the pillory were three empty nooses and they realised they had not only saved their lives, but the lives of the two Braley sisters as well. 
The story hasn't really finished. They got back to Sarnsby Hall. Sir Richard was delighted to see his daughter. And they had a meal and a celebration that went long into the night. However, 200 years later, in the nearby village of Warley, near Clitheroe, two local doctors sat round a roaring fire in a beautiful old inn called the Warley Arms, Dr Whitaker and Dr Dawson. They discussed the Pendlewitch story and they discussed the Sarsby Hall story. And that's when Whitaker said to Dawson, I believe young Gracie Sarbats was probably telling the truth. How? said his companion. Well, the way she described those dogs in the river are exactly the same description of the dogs belonging to the Pendle Witches. Alison Device, Anne Redfern, Elizabeth Southern and Anne Whittle all had dogs. Tib, Ball, Fancy, Dandy. And these dogs are exactly the same shape as was described by young Gracie Sarbats. And don't forget, she would not have been in the court that day to hear the hearings. She was an eyewitness account. But most importantly, let's write to York Minster and get permission from the Archbishop of York to exhume the Walshman coffin. They wrote to York Minster. Uh, the Archbishop of York sent an envoy, the Reverend John Franks, to make sure that the uh, work was done in a professional manner and also to Church of England rules and regulations. They waited for nightfall. They lit two lanterns and they made their way to the Sarnsby Church. There they paced out the exact location of the Walshman grave and they started to dig. Just two feet beneath the surface they came across a lozenge shaped child's coffin. Under Church of England rules and regulations it was opened and found to contain absolutely nothing. It seems that young Gracie may just have been telling the truth. We shall never ever know. Well, I'll tell you what made, what made my blood curdle. When you said about the, the blood of children being drunk, we hear a lot of stories on the, uh, the going around right now, don't we, about it still going on. But uh, uh, we, yeah, we yeah. should try not to get into that too much either. But, um, well, as I say, David, the only window we have in this whole story is a book written in 1613 by a chap called Thomas Potts. Mm. Um, Thomas Potts was sent up from London by King James I, along with Sir Edmund Bromley, Sir James Oldham, uh, to oversee the proceedings. And um, Thomas Potts wrote this book, which became extremely popular. And um, his family to this very, very day received huge royalties. It's the only window we have into this whole story, but this... No two ways about it, David. If Steven Spielberg got his teeth into the story of the Pendlewitches, indeed the Sarsby Hall witches, he would have a Hollywood blockbuster. Absolutely, yeah. It's amazing that, to, to me that nobody's ever actually done that. You know? There's been many documentaries, yeah. but, but they've been quite boring, really. They've been very boring documentaries, all based on Potts' book, of course. Yeah. Uh, so we need to get some professional actors in there. And... Um, Buildings like Sarsby Hall still exist. Lancaster Castle still exists. Uh, the home of Alice Nutter in Rough Lee still exists. The home of Jeanette Preston in Gisborne still exists. So they could be used again, David. And mm. uh, again, I mean, um, Spielberg is one of those great producers that could really produce a, a blockbuster. Yeah. I mean, the only attempt they ever, ever really tried with that type of thing was uh, the Witchfinder General, wasn't it? it um... Oh, yeah. Matthew Hopkins, yeah, yeah. And there was another one with Oliver Reed, I think. That was quite, um, The Devils, wasn't it? That was quite a nasty, oh, yes. a, a nasty yeah. film back then. Um, I think it was almost banned, wasn't it? Because of, uh... Uh, Gosh, yeah, yeah. And of course then there's, there's the Salem, uh, the trials in Salem, which uh, of course were done under British rule mm. in, in Massachusetts. And again, they used a child witness. But um, they, they have made a good film on the Salem witches, and that was exceptionally good, really. But... Um, uh, you know, it, it, it was a terrible period of time, particularly for women, David, because in those days women weren't allowed to possess a brain, would you believe? Mm. And, uh, we would really be looked down on as, as servants more than, than human beings, really. Yeah, yeah, it's disgusting, really. I mean, even, there, there, are, there are still countries in the world that still do treat women like that, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, terrible. Um, 
I was just like, on some of your tours, do you ever get, um, do people generally believe in ghosts, or do you get um, people, um, I don't know, sort of questioning the, the truth of the, the validity of some of these stories? Uh, well, the one question I get asked a lot, David, is, um, have I ever seen a ghost? Well, the answer is no. Mm. Uh, but there again, I'm not a medium. Mm. I'm not a psychic. I'm not a clairvoyant. Uh, I'm a collector of ghosts. Um, I do get hired by quite a few of the paranormal companies like Haunted Happenings, D- Dust Till Dawn, Spooktacular, and they will send groups to Pendle. Uh, I will tell them the whole story from the forest of Pendle, a place called Malkin Tower, and they bring their mediums in uh, they can see things which I can't I will be honest with you mm. what has happened on a few occasions David and uh, I can't really get my head around it and it's happened in on the coldest days of January and December this beautiful aroma can come from nowhere and it's like, like walking into a flower shop uh, and it, it is actually quite amazing when it happens really because um but the, the mediums that, that you know uh, have picked this up, and they they believe it's actually something from the other side mm. that has brought sweet smell with it. Yeah. beautiful. Smell. I have experienced that myself. It's strange, isn't it? How it come, you know, you get the smell of tobacco or something coming up, uh, yes, and there's no yes. smoking around. No, very very true. Hmm. Do you get ever, do you ever get people a lot of non believer sort of uh, poo poo it all and uh, sort of have a go at you, <laughs> or, or or does that not happen? Uh, well, usually it has happened, but uh, usually with alcohol. Uh, when people oh, being drunk, they, they, yeah, they but can get a, li- a couple of beers. Yeah, they can get a wee bit stroppy sometimes. But um, I never advertise myself, David, as a ghost hunter, no, or uh, uh, or a paranormal investigator. I'm just a collector of ghost stories, which um, I, I've always found fascinating. Really. Yeah. What are your favourite books on the subject? Have you got any favourites? Um. Well, I tend to find uh, not so much books, David, but talking to eyewitness accounts. Mm. They're the people that I find absolutely fascinating. And you've really introduced my next story, actually, Uh, because it it is a very beautiful story, but also a very, very true story. Um, Anyone listening out there, this wasn't rehearsed. (laughs) No, 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 no. I had an acquaintance, I wouldn't say a friend, but a chap I knew quite well. Um, A lovely chap called Ian, and um, Ian had quite a marvellous life, really. Um, He was once a professional footballer with Preston North End Football Club. He then ran a business in Clitheroe, and um, I got to know him quite well, actually. He was always a very, very pleasant man to talk to. And um, he he has actually passed away, but um, I met him... uh, quite a few times before he died and uh, he said you know Simon I'm one of the luckiest men on the planet I've died three times and he he was actually um, pronounced dead three times but through our marvellous National Health Service and paranormal uh, para- paramedics um, his life was saved he had three very very serious heart attacks and was saved by defibrillators and of course professional help um, I met him after heart attack number two and he telephoned me and said Simon I've got one hell of a story for you Um, I went to this um, cafe in Clitheroe called the Emporium now the Emporium was an old Methodist chapel a very very beautiful building Um, it it almost Greek to look at from the outside huge pillars etc and um, in 1962 it closed down for a while it was a car showroom and then it became uh, the Emporium. Now, the Emporium is a bit like a bistro. It's a bit like a wine bistro. You can get meals there as well. Um, after heart attack number two, Ian went in there with a friend, and uh, it was about 10.30 in the morning, and they ordered two coffees, and Ian looked up and saw at the end of the bar a man that seemed to want to get his attention. Uh, this man looked quite scruffy, really. He had uh, long, long greyish hair. He had glasses a white pony-neck sweater on, corduroy pants, and some brogue shoes, and he seemed to want to get Ian's attention. Each time Ian looked up, he was looking straight at him, which embarrassed him a little bit. He then nudged his pal sitting next to him and said, What's that man at the bar doing? He he keeps looking at me. His friend turned and looked at the bar. There's no one there. Yes, there is, said Ian. He's at the end of the bar. I promise you, I'm telling you, there's no one there. The man then turned and seemed to walk past the bar and disappear. That's when Ian telephoned me, because he realised he'd seen something very, very strange. Um, 
he came to my house, I made him a cup of coffee, we had a good chat. I then went upstairs and I got a fantastic book called Clitheroe, A Thousand Years by the Late Arthur Langshaw. And there's one section there on the four Methodist chapels that have all closed down. I came downstairs, sat down next to Ian and skipped to the page and said, oh, there's, there's the old the old Methodist chapel on Moor Lane, uh, closed in 1962. And the last reverend was called Mr. John Mulleno. I then flipped the page over and there was a photograph of Mr. John Mulleno. Ian went a deathly white. He said, that's the man I saw. And the man was indeed wearing a white pearl neck sweater. He had uh, what looked like um, corduroy pants on. It was a black and white photograph and brogue shoes. And Ian said, Simon, that is him. That is him. Sadly, within six weeks of Ian coming to my house, he had passed away with a fourth and final heart attack but that story came from his heart it really really did um i've done many tours um from the emporium and i do use ian's story and uh i've often wondered if he's looking down from up there and having a bit of a giggle as i tell the story but Mm. he was absolutely convinced when he saw the photograph it it just confirmed the story quite beautifully really it may makes you wonder if maybe he was um he, he was getting a message from that particular person that was going to that was maybe going to help him along on his way maybe because you do hear that people when they're close to death they do see people on the other side and who knows maybe he was one of his guides or something quite possible what I do know is when the building was purchased uh, by a, a firm called James's Place there are quite a few hotels in the area um, right behind the building is a Sainsbury's supermarket and when they started to dig their foundations in behind the Emporium, they were horrified because they found the foundations actually encroached on a little cemetery. Mm. And as a result, of course, the uh, authorities were brought in. They said, well, you've got to remove all the coffins. You've got to remove all the interned people there. And they were moved to nearby uh, Waddington Road Cemetery. And that's when strange things started to happen in the Emporium. Uh, one of the coffins taken down to Waddington Road was that of the Reverend John Mulleno, and it was in his dying wishes to be buried in that cemetery. So who knows, he might be a little bit angry about having, having his body removed from there and taken down to Waddington Road. Hmm. Now, what was that book called again? Clitheroe Ghosts by Arthur... Uh, it was called Clitheroe, A Thousand Years by the Late Arthur Langshaw. It's a thousand fantastic thousand years. Book. Clitheroe, right. A Thousand Years. I was trying to and scrub it down as you said it, but I was trying to keep up with, <laughs> with what you were saying as well. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, I do tend to use that book, uh, well, a lot of the information on it, uh, on, on my tours, because the, uh, it, it, it does bring a lot of history into the actual guided ghost walk as well, David. Yeah, is it available still on Amazon? Uh, I believe uh, you you might be able to get it on Amazon. It's possible. Um, I, I've got quite a copy, quite an old one, actually, which my mother left me, really, but um, it, it is a fascinating read. It really, really is. Mm, yeah, let's have a look and see if it's uh, available. Or well, usually when they're that old, they're usually, <laughs> usually going for silly money, aren't they? Like a thousand pounds. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, very much so, David, yeah. You do yeah. tend to get that. Ah, yeah, that was an interesting story. So, um, well, what are your own beliefs in ghosts? You well, obviously uh, do believe in them, don't you? Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, David, I, I believe there is a life after this one. I mean, uh, I, I really do. And I, th- I think um, when, when talking to people like Ian, I mean, Ian um, very, very nearly got to the other side. And I, I think he came back and uh, mm. came back probably with, with, with some powers, actually. But I do believe there's another life after this one. And um, I also personally believe that if someone has lost their life in a very, very sad and horrific manner, then their spirits might f- might still have a connection with the area. But there again, you see, I'm not a paranormal investigator. No. It, it's the stories which interest me, David, not so much the scientific Yeah, side like the mark. evidence behind it, yeah. But, but that, I mean, that's right. Well, when people die like a, a traumatic death, like a murder or a sudden accident or something, uh, they often, often it seems that they don't, they don't know they're dead. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I believe that's true. Yes, I, I, that's very feasible. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Well, it does seem to be the case, doesn't it? Because they seem to relive that um, that moment. Yeah, yeah. That's a, I, I don't know if you know, I had Richard Felix on the show earlier this year, uh, well, probably oh, a couple true. of months ago. Yeah, and he, yeah. Re- he related quite a few interesting stories, and um, 
you know, I, I don't know if you did hear that story, but but, uh, but it was quite a good show actually. I quite enjoyed it. But, uh, I'm sure. I think you, sure. you you've met him a couple of times as well, didn't you? Yes, yeah. Um, I've met him in Derby actually at uh, the Derby Jail. Yeah, we had a, a few beers and the odd brandy and. A right good chap. But there's a lot of people there as well from the Most Haunted uh, team, and uh, Phil Wyman was there as well. And it was quite nice to have a chat to those those people, really. Yeah, yeah, it's quite an interesting place if anyone get, ever gets a chance to go and visit. It is, and uh, what I do like about uh, Richard is a uh, very very enthusiastic, and he's a great collector of ghost stories. And um, yeah, I suppose I am as well, really. Yeah, much well. like yourself. Yeah. So, what's your next story you've got lined up for us? This is a very, very beautiful story. It's an affair of the heart, really. And um, we're going to make our way up to a lovely county, which now sadly has gone. And that county was called Westmoreland. Westmoreland, as the locals call it, is now South Cumbria. Uh, Cumberland and Westmoreland both amalgamated in 1974 to make up one big county rather than two. Uh, of course... South Cumbria has the beautiful Lake District, mm. but there are some very, very gorgeous areas uh, just beneath the English Lake District, uh, down towards the Lancashire border. And this is a story from the Victorian period. And we're going to make our way to a little hamlet called Hevesham. And above Hevesham is a huge, huge limestone outcrop, uh, about a mile long and about a quarter of a mile wide, with a forest on the top of it. The views from there are absolutely gorgeous. In fact, Sir Winston Churchill went there many times, and he said the views captivated him. And the views are still there to this very, very day. You can see right into the English Lake District, right into what we call the Kent Estuary, and right out to the Irish Sea. It is absolutely beautiful. And so is the forest on top of it. But we're now going to turn the clock back to 1856 and a gentleman called John Padstone. Now, John was a London journalist. He worked for the Central News Agency. And in the 1850s, of course, you couldn't go abroad for your holidays, really, uh, mainly due to travelling problems, if you will. So what John used to do when he had his summer holidays, he would pick a certain part of Great Britain and he would go for a walking holiday. He would walk from town to town, but he would also plan his visits beautifully by writing to inns and bed and breakfast and planning his uh, his walks beautifully. He bought, of course, a map of South Lakeland and planned his walk that day. He was going to walk from the town of Kendall to the town of Carnforth, and uh, that route would take him uh, to the village of Hevesham and a lovely old inn called the Blue Bell Hotel in Hevesham, which is still there to this very, very day. He set off walking from Kendall, and um, he didn't know the area very well. He had his map with him. But um, by around half past five in the afternoon, it was beginning to go dark, and the clouds above his head seemed to get darker. As he entered the little road that would take him over Hevesham Head through the forest, a wind suddenly whipped up. The cloud above his head seemed to get darker and darker as he walked down up towards the forest. You imagine you're now in the centre of Hevesham Head with forestation on either side and the track went straight through it. The moonlight flickered through the leaves above his head, illuminating parts of the road in front of him. He thought, I'd better get to the Bluebell Hotel very soon because it will be pitch black very, very soon. I've underestimated my timings here, really. As it happened, he only had about two miles to go. As he came round a corner on the track on the top of Hevesham Head, he saw in the distance what looked like a sheep in the centre of the road, sitting in a puddle of water. As he advanced towards what he thought was the sheep, the sheep took the shape of a female, a female sitting in a white nightgown, soaking wet, sitting in a pool of water. She was combing her hair. Um, he could make out a face in the moonlight. And she was stunningly attractive. A very beautiful young girl. And he said, what are you doing sitting here? She couldn't hear him. She didn't even know he was there. He stood in front of her and suddenly realised she was not part of this world. John started to run away. 
He got a hundred yards away and turned round and there he saw her illuminated in bright moonlight and thought he heard the words, Oh, oh, when will he come? When? John then quickly departed. He got to the Bluebell Hotel and was delighted to see the lantern outside the building and delighted to see a meal waiting for him and a flagon of real ale. Quite surprisingly, when he got to the Bluebell, he didn't tell anyone. And when he got back to London, he didn't mention it to anyone. But some six years later, literally six years later, he thought he would go back and retrace his steps. He made his way along the same route, and there was no one there. He got to the area where the pool of water had been, and there was no one there at all. He then got to the Bluebell Hotel, and he walked up to the bar and told the landlord what had happened to him six years previously. Now, the landlord was cleaning a pint of, uh, a pint flagon, and it slipped through his fingers and smashed at his feet. His eyes lit up, and he said, Eh, hey, I reckon you've seen the ghost of Rosie Gill. Oh, yes, tell me about her, said John. Well, I will do. Uh, Rosie was a very, very beautiful young lady. She had long black hair, like a raven-coloured hair, a very bonny girl. Um, she lived at a, a farm at the top of Hebersham Head called Mabin Hall. Uh, all the local lads really fancied her because she was such a stunning young lady. Uh, she reminded me very much of, that, of, 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 of a goddess. She was so beautiful, said the landlord. Now, she only had eyes for one lad in the area, a young lad called Michael Brown. And Michael lived in the small hamlet of Hincaster, not too far from Hebersham Head. He was a farm labourer's lad and she really did like him and he liked her and they made plans to to get married at St Peter's Church here in Hebersham on Christmas Day well all the local lads were jealous of Michael in fact I remember in here oh a good six years whoa, a good ten years ago uh, one or two lads saying he that Michael Brown I'd like to crack his skull he's got the beautiful girl in the area well Michael was found dead at the top of Hevisham Head, in a field very near Mabin Hall. His horse was by his side. The local doctor was called, and the doctor looked at Michael's injuries and said, well, he's had some severe cranial injuries here, which aren't really what I'd call identical with falling off a horse, but um, there's no one around here, so I'm going to record his death as death by misadventure, an accident. Many people believe that Michael had been murdered. Now, Rosie's father was the first person to be told, and he thought, I just can't tell me daughter. I can't. It'll break her heart. They're going to get married in four days' time. I, I just can't tell her. Well, Rosie came home that night with a skip in her step. She was looking forward to getting married in three days' time at St. Peter's in Hebersham. Her father just couldn't bear to tell her. On Christmas Day morning, she came rushing into her mother and father's bedroom. Where's Michael? Where's Michael? We're getting married today. We're getting married today. Her father looked up and put his hands around his daughter's waist and hugged her deeply. Love, I'm so sorry, love. I can't keep it back any longer. Michael's dead. Rosie screamed. Her heart was snapped in two. She screamed and screamed. As she screamed that Christmas day, huge black clouds came floating up from the Kent Estuary towards the village of Hebisham, and there was an almighty thunderstorm. Bolts of lightning came down from the heavens, and heavy, heavy rain came down. Rosie ran down the lane. Her mother and father were deeply distressed, and they said, no, let her go. She'll come back in her own time. Let her go. Rosie never came back. She was found on Boxing Day morning, laying down in the road in a small pool of rainwater. She had somehow drowned in the rainwater. Padster was told the whole story and took a deep sigh and said, well, I did see the ghost of Jane Gill. Hmm. Oh. she was there, Moss Park, that one. It's it's a very beautiful road. It is, yeah. It is. A, it's a lovely area, isn't it? Well, well South Lake. Well, all, is all, all of those areas are lovely. That, uh, uh, totally spoilt. Lots of limestone outcrops hmm. and lots of forestation and these beautiful little farms that have been there for many many years. Yeah. 
Yeah. But of course, they get a lot of wet weather up there as well, don't they? Obviously, that's why it keeps so green, I think. English Lake District, yeah. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, well, have you got things lined up for this year? Or, or, or I mean, have, have you been any tours at all? Or, or, is, uh, or is the distance in really sort of finished it? I mean, can you not can you not take coach tours out with people? Um, well, uh, I had a coach tour on Friday. It was the first one since the 27th of March. Uh, it was um, a fantastic tour. It was a, it was a Pendle Witch tour where we made our way to all the Pendle mm. villages. And it was great to be working again. And then all of a sudden, the government said, from now on, only groups of six can meet. Yeah. And, uh, and I've lost so much work. I mean, I've got my diary here, David, actually, and the amount of coaches have, that have cancelled, uh, I've just lost count, really. That's what I mean. So uh, that's kind of ended that whole thing, is it, really? Yeah. Uh, also, I met a, a lovely guy called Jason Carl, a, a lovely lad. And uh, Jason had been working for Most Haunted uh, when they first started. And he came up with a great idea to make a pilot show, and he asked me to get involved, mm. uh, which I which I did do, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed the pilot show. And uh, that was uh, was was sent to the commissioners, but because of COVID, uh, it's all been put on hold. Uh, so again, so it hasn't got off the ground yet. It hasn't even got off the ground. In fact, I don't think it's even been watched by the commissioners, David. But um, it is a shame because um, it was again storytelling. And uh, I, I think the audiences are out there to to listen to good good ghost stories. Oh, certainly, and certainly by yourself because you tell them so well as well. It's I, I enjoy it, David. I enjoy it, and that, that's half the battle, really. Yeah, I mean your your show. Was it called? Come and give it a plug. Um, ghost tales of the unexpected. On the same paranormal UK radio network as this one, and uh, someone gets a very good following, and, and I can say that firsthand. I know. <laughs> Uh, it's very popular, especially, I, I think you're very popular in the States. I think they like to hear your gentlemanly English voice, don't they? Well, the, the Americans, they, they can be um, very, very oh. gullible, can't they, really? Uh, it's really funny, I did visit, visit um, Philadelphia quite a few years ago, and um, I went into a bar in Philadelphia, and you're quite right, they do like the English accent, and this chap said, uh, you know, way back in uh, 1944, I was in the United States 8th Army Air Force in Leicestershire, and you know, a guy called Peter Nesbitt, uh, no, I've never actually met him, and he was quite shocked that I didn't know this chap from Leicestershire. <laughs> yeah. Mind you, we've done the same, I, I, uh, a friend of mine went to uh, Yosemite Park, but he was actually asking for Yesamite, so we're, we're all the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In Birmingham. <laughs> oh, Birmingham. That's, that's yeah. a famous one. But yeah, uh, what I did find amazing uh, in Philadelphia, though, David, um, I've got on this, um, it was a double-decker tourism bus, and went right down Independence Mall, past the Liberty Bell, and um, the tour guide, a lovely girl, she said, and on our left we got Pendle Hill. Thought, what? <laughs> Another what? one. And there was this gorgeous white building with the words Quaker Movement, Pendle Hill. And, you know, way back in 1743, a gentleman from Leicestershire, would you believe, called George Fox. Uh, George was a real rebel, an absolute rebel. And uh, he'd been in prison no fewer than 15 times for blasphemy by saying, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. You don't need to go to college, to theological college to become a priest. Anyone can be a priest and anyone can pray to the good Lord anywhere. And he walked on top of Pendle Hill, sat down, and had this vision of a brand new religion called the Quaker Movement. He came down from Pendle Hill, was immediately arrested, sent to Lancaster, and was going to be executed for the 15th time. He'd been all over Great Britain and always arrested and condemned to death for blasphemy. <laughs> but on each occasion, he was reprieved. Now, um, after 1740, 1740, well, 1750, this country became a republic, and Oliver Cromwell was the Lord Protector. And Cromwell heard about this man causing all this grief and said, I want to see this George Fox person. And Fox was brought to him. And George Fox actually reduced Cromwell to tears. And Cromwell said, look, this man's done nothing wrong at all. Let him go. He went straight across the Atlantic Ocean to Pennsylvania, met William Penn. And, of course, in America, the Quaker movement is huge, absolutely huge. And uh, in Philadelphia, of course, is the uh, capital of uh, Pennsylvania, is this beautiful white building uh, called Pendle Hill. It's a, it's a great story, really. 
it's probably, well, they've probably got the name from from the, the same yeah. same thing. I mean, there's, exactly. lots, there's lots of uh, English names that uh, end, up, end up over there, aren't there? Oh yeah, yeah. Hmm, interesting. You, you've just um, you, you've really whetted my appetite tonight. Yeah, go go ahead. Really, um, this is quite a gorgeous story. Again, it has got it has got an American theme to it, really. Um, we will go back to Sarsby Hall, and to this very, very day, Sarsby Hall's got to pay for itself. Mm. It gets no help off the government, although it is a grade one listed building. And one of the most lucrative events that take place there are weddings. You can get married at Sarsby Hall, would you believe? And um, they have weddings, uh, I think, booked up for the next, uh, next 18 months, every, every single Saturday. But by far the most famous wedding ever to take place there was the wedding of a British Army officer to a young lady called Jane Bradall, whose father was the third owner of Sarsby Hall. Uh, he was a serving lieutenant in the British Army. Uh, they got married on the 21st of October, uh, 1771. Um, being a, a sir, uh, a serving British Army soldier, he was sent overseas to the garrisons at Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and Boston. Uh, when he got to Boston, his wife absolutely loved New England, and she said, Oh, John, I wish you could resign your commission. We need to settle here. This looks like the land of opportunity. Great idea. I'm sick and tired of the Army anyway. So they settled and they formed their own business and were doing very well. Their neighbours were doing very well. This was the land of opportunity. However, one person recognised this more than anyone else, and that was good old King George back in England, and he thought, these people need taxing and taxing and taxing again. So John said to his wife one day, I'm working my socks off, and all I'm doing is paying tax to the king back in England. Now, he then met a gentleman called George Washington, and George Washington's family came from a place called Yelland Redmain, which is Carnforth in North Lancashire. And Washington recognised Cresap's Northern English accent and said, John, I believe you've served in the British Army. I would like to form a rebel army and throw the British out of North America. Will you join me? I will join you. I'm sick and tired of this taxation. It's got beyond a joke. So therefore, John Creasup became what's called a Pathfinder General in Washington's rebel forces. He was at Lexington, Concord, Bunker Hill, Ticonderoga, and the final surrender at Yorktown in 1781. Now the Brits had gone. America was an independent country. And Washington became their first president, and he invited Creasup to his headquarters in Washington. Ah, John. I'd like to offer you a position in the new United States Armed Forces as a general. Will you take up this position? I will, sir. My quest for you is to encourage the natives to leave New Hampshire, New Jersey, and indeed New England. Will you carry this out? I will, sir. Well, it's fair to say that John Creasup committed many illegal crimes against the local natives, and many a brave and many a score died due to his actions. But all good things come to an end when he was captured by the Huron North American Canadian Indians. And just like John Wayne in a famous Western movie, he was tied to the totem pole and ordered to be given the death of a thousand cuts. Now, Creasup was a Yorkshireman, and we all know about Yorkshiremen that can be very, very stubborn folk. In fact, Sir Ranulph Fiennes will take no people from Yorkshire on any of his tours because they like to whinge and complain about <laughs> everything. Creasup was no different. Tied to the totem pole, showed no emotion, and was heard to say to the Indians, You're getting out from me. The Indians had never seen such courage, such bravery. He wasn't even scared to die. They thought he must be some form of devil, and they released his bonds. He rushed into the forest and got back to Washington's headquarters. Uh, sir, I've had enough of this, sir. I would like to return to my native Craven in West Yorkshire. George Washington said there and then, John, my country is indebted to you. You will always be an American citizen. He got back to his native Craven in West Yorkshire, a place called Elsac and is buried there. His grave proudly says General John Creasap, United States Armed Forces, and every 4th of July, a member of the American Embassy will make his or her way up to Elsap to make sure the grave has been polished. 
and fresh flowers placed on top of it. You could say, David, that he is definitely all Yorkshire, all American hero. Hmm. I've never heard that story before. Oh, that's very interesting. I'm sure there's very, many Americans out there that probably won't have heard it either. Um, I, when we talk about places like the Alamo, there were a lot of um, Irishmen and Englishmen, and uh, they weren't all Americans, were they? A few, ten, nope. a few Tennesseans, and um, but I think most of them were Europeans, weren't they? They, they were. There were a lot of English boys there, that, and, and Welsh, and, yeah. and Scotsmen. Yes, we can't, they, they we can't forget the Scotsmen, can we? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, yeah. Uh, so, so, David, um, there was one other little story that, so, that could really link onto that one, actually, quite well, really. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, for, for our American cousins, it's um, the sort of story that would again make a great Hollywood movie. Uh, so we go back to 1781. The Brits have surrendered at Yorktown with the help of the French. The French and the Americans joined forces, and the Brits surrendered. America became independent, and she started to flex her muscles by having her own army, her own navy. And um, towards um, the early part of the 19th century, there were many incursions by American troops into Canada, and they set fire to Canadian government buildings. Now, of course, Canada was part of the Commonwealth, part of great the great British Commonwealth. And the Canadians got very annoyed, and so did the Brits as well. And Lord Wellington, at Horse Guards, uh, summoned one of his top generals, Major General Ross, and also brought in the Royal Navy, Admiral Cockburn, and said, Gentlemen, I would like you to teach our American cousins a lesson. Could you come with a plan, please? Well, the Royal Navy and the Army got together, and they said, Right. We need to sail up the Potomac River straight into Washington, D.C. and attack the White House and the congressional buildings and set fire to them. <laughs> Wellington uh, gave Major General Ross the very, very cream of his armed forces. The Royal Navy, of course, had their own Marines. But the army brought in the, uh, the very, very famous Royal Scots, which had a, a great reputation, the Royal Green Jackets, which were light infantry, and the York and Lancasters that had done so well in the Peninsula War, the very, very cream of the British Army. Some 7,500 men altogether, along with the Royal Naval ratings, they set off, and they made their way straight towards the Potomac River, which would lead into Washington. Of course, the Americans weren't stupid. They had scouts, and word filtered back to Washington that this British invasion force was on its way. They had five days to get all the um, preparations ready, and President Madison of the White House said, We know the British, when they land, they'll get their fifes and their drums, and they'll start to slowly walk towards us. We'll get our cannon, our cavalry there, and we'll wipe them out before they even get to the shoreline. We know how the Brits work. We've been selling them for many years now. Now, this was an invading force, and Major General Ross told all his senior officers, when you land, don't wait for us. As soon as the first people land, go straight to Washington. And that's exactly what they did. They were rowed ashore very, very quickly. But instead of waiting... Uh, by uh, getting the fives and drums ready, which the Americans thought they would do, and probably having a cup of tea, getting the campfires going. They didn't. They just advanced inland. And they burst through the American lines at what we call the Blandenburg Heights. And one Royal Scots officer mentioned that the Americans were running away so fast that some of our advance parties were actually overtaking them. They got into a deserted Washington, D.C. on the 24th of August. 1814. Um, the senior officers made their way inside the White House and there they saw table after table with beautiful cutlery and hot stew ready over the fires. The building had been completely deserted and this was a meal to celebrate the American victory, except the Brits, of course, had got to Washington. Major General Ross and the senior Royal Naval and Army officers sat down and enjoyed an extremely good meal on the American government. In the meantime, one Royal um, Green Jacket officer went upstairs and made his way into President Madison's bedroom. He was amazed to find Dolly Madison there, the First Lady. She was the only person left in the building. Uh, he assured her that he wouldn't hurt her. 
And she said, all I want to do is just rescue the portrait of George Washington. With a knife, she cut away at the canvas, rolled it into a scroll, and left as quickly as possible. The officer then helped himself to President Madison's um, shirts, and also a large bundle of love letters, which in 1997 re-emerged at the BBC show Antiques Roadshow at Brighton, <laughs> where they were put on display. So the officers had this fantastic meal, they then set fire to the White House. The roof caves in. They go next door to the Congressional Building, set fire to that. And on the hills overlooking Washington, there is a red glow from the city down below, because all the warships are on fire as well. And one young lady hummed a tune called the Star Spangled Banner. And um, that, to course, this very day is the American National Anthem, which was conceived that when the Brits set fire to Washington. Major General Ross and his men then made their way back to the Blandenburg Heights and rejoined their warships. They'd only lost seven men killed and 13 wounded. The American casualties were five times that, that, that amount. Um, Hollywood has never made a film, and I don't think even if they did, Mel Gibson could save the White House from being set on fire. <laughs> but uh, it's a great story. It's a great story, David. Yeah, it is. So that's where the Star Spangled Banner came from. So yes. I wonder where she got it from. Well, she must have just started humming it. Oh, can't you see? Uh, I think that's the very, very first, um, the very, very first part of the hymn, really. But uh, it must have been quite a shock. Oh, yeah, great she, yeah, I suppose if she was just humming it or so, it's something that she yeah. could have just made up. Yeah. yeah. Mm, very interesting. It, it is a fascinating story, really, but I'm t I've never been to the White House. I've never been there. But I'm told that to this very day, scorch marks can be seen in one of the rooms. And they've left it there for a reason, of course. Mm. They've left it there for a reason. And um, I believe they do have guided tours um, of Washington. I don't know if you're allowed to go inside the White House itself, but the story of the day the Brits arrived uh, is still remembered. And uh, really, when you think of it, uh, it was a, a, a very daring raid. It really was a very daring raid. Mm. Reprisals for the Canadian government buildings being set on fire, of course. Yeah. Well, seeing how things go next year, I was actually hoping to go to Washington next year anyway. So um, I would like to do a, a White House tour. So if I beat you to it, I'll let you know. Well, uh, apparently, um, uh, ghosts there, you got, uh, there are quite a few ghosts there. Dolly Madison is one of them. Because uh, she felt ashamed because her husband ran away, mm. and uh, she stayed in the White House and uh, had this confrontation with this royal green jacket officer. Uh, and she's, of course, a national hero in America to this very, very day. Um, but um, it, it is a, a really, really beautiful story. There's no ways about it. Absolutely. Well, Simon, um, I guess that's it. Unless you've really got any more amazing stories for us, so I guess we'll draw a line mm. on that one. I've got a date right now, David. With a bottle of beer. Yeah. <laughs> I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've got to be honest. I've been drinking one of those, you know, those little import ones. I've just been drinking one. Oh. It's been. I tell you what. Anyone listening today, it's been such a hot day here, hasn't it? Oh yeah, it really has. A, a, it's been a gorgeous day. But um, I like these real ales, actually, David. And uh, there's one called Timothy Taylor's. Uh, from um, the town of Keithley in West Yorkshire. It's a gorgeous pint. And would you believe it's doing really well, thanks to, of all people, Madonna. Really? And she was seen, she was seen uh, gulping um, a, from a bottle uh, <laughs> after one of her um, gigs. And I was shocked that this uh, young American girl should be drinking bitter from West Yorkshire. Was it ice cold? It must have been. Yeah. It must have been. I mean, an ice cold beer it goes down really well. I'm going to open it. <laughs> Right now, Dave, I'm going to have one, yeah. Good, right. I I'll, shall I'll let you go and enjoy that then. And uh, thank you for coming thank on, you. Simon. It's been fantastic having you on. You've made... Uh, My pleasure, Dave. You've, uh, you've, you've done, made a very um, impressive appearance again. And uh, I would encourage anyone out there to catch Simon Edmussel's show on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Um, I thought, was it? Is it one a month you do? Or is it... Uh, it's just one a month, actually. It's usually the, the, the last... The last Thursday of the month, David. Yeah, but it goes out all week anyway, doesn't it, on the on the network? Yes, I, I believe so. Also, you can download the uh, download the uh, MP3. We call it now, not the podcast, don't we? Of it beforehand. That's always not there That's on demand, and you can listen to all the old shows as well. 
Yeah. Okay, Simon, thank you very much for coming on. It's been fantastic talking to you again. I hope things pick up for you and your business again. Um, thank you, David. Thank you. I mean, I can't see any, a light at the end of the tunnel for, for oh, a couple of months God. yet, but um, we're edging towards Christmas. Just hope it all settles down again and things can get back to the proper normal, not the new normal. We don't want that. No, no, you're right. You're right, David. Uh, as long as we can still have a the odd beer now and then, there's nothing wrong with that, is there? Really? No, absolutely. And uh, hopefully, I'll actually get to get you meet get to meet you again next year. Uh, oh, I'd love love to see. I was you, hoping to, to this year, but we didn't get around to it. So, <laughs> no, we shall no, see how we go next year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, take care of yourself, Simon. Thanks again. And, My um, pleasure, David. Good night to everyone listening out there, and uh, thank you for Simon coming on and. Um, You've been listening to Paranormal UK Radio Network. I'm David Young, and you're listening to Paranormal Dimensions. Thank you. Tune in again next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Paranormal Dimensions is as bright and powerful as our celestial star, the sun. And although it's expending thousands of pounds of energy every minute of the day, have no fear. There's plenty left. Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network.